We are entering into a first today. This is the first time in 11 years of ministry that I have ever preached on this passage. Think about that for a moment. I have probably done, in 11 years, probably written and preached over 530 sermons, and never in those 530 sermons have I used this passage or any of the ones like it that talk about divorce. Probably because it scared me, if I'm honest. There are some very hard truths in this passage, and while I don't think as a pastor I've shied away from preaching about sin and calling all of us out on things we've done wrong, I thought that I was making a pastoral decision in not using this passage. When I think about the number of divorced persons in this room or in any of my congregations, or the number of people married to someone who was married before, I never ever wanted to say something from the pulpit that would hurt them. I think Jesus' words to us are often uncomfortable, and sometimes the Holy Spirit can step on toes, mine included, but I didn't want to hurt anyone uh, with the words that I would say about a passage like this. And so it's with just a little bit of fear and trepidation that I enter into today's sermon on a hard topic, divorce, and perhaps an even harder topic, marriage. We are, after all, on the third week of a sermon series that's doing just this, taking a look at the hard sayings of Jesus, the ones that make us cringe and make us question, that make us wonder and make us confused. But really, I think the last two that we've done, while a little bit strange at first glance, like Jesus telling us to hate our family, have not been ones that really made us uncomfortable, that made us squirm. But before we get too much into the passage or into the sermon, I want to say two things right up front so that they're really clear from the outset. And so even if you hear nothing else, you will hear this. Number one, God does not hate you if you are divorced. You are not going to hell because you are divorced. Number two, I believe that God does not desire for any of us, any of us, to be in relationships that hurt us in relationships that are abusive in any way. So while I don't think God likes divorce, I think that God would choose us being safe over us being in a marriage that breaks us. So I want to be clear about those two things before we look a little closer at the passage. In today's scripture, we encounter something pretty typical for an interaction between Jesus and the Jewish leadership of his day. Mark tells us that some Pharisees came and tried to test Jesus. That was like their favorite thing to do. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? The Pharisees knew that any answer to this question would open a can of worms. In first century Judaism, divorce was taken for granted. The only aspect of it that was debatable was how serious the grounds for divorce should be. There were kind of two schools of thought among the Jewish rabbis and leadership, and a great debate was being raged over which school was correct in their interpretation of Hebrew scriptures regarding divorce. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to answer in such a way that would land him in one of the two camps and thus alienate him from the other group that would make people angry. So how did Jesus respond to their question? In his response, Jesus first asked them to cite the law of Moses. In verse 4, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. They were quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24 and verse 1. It says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, give it to her and send her from his house. In this law, a man could divorce his wife if he found something indecent. There was no court needed. He just wrote his wife a divorce certificate and sent her on her way. The question became then, what does something indecent mean? The word indecent is translated from the Hebrew word erva, and it literally means nakedness or shame. During the time of Jesus, as I said, there were two divisions among the Pharisees, among the rabbis, called the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. We've talked before about some disagreements that those two schools had. The school of Shammai taught that there was only one ground for divorce, and that was in the case of sexual immorality like marital infidelity and adultery. They interpreted the word erva to mean sexual indecency. 
On the other hand, the school of Hillel interpreted the word very liberally. They taught that the word erva meant any kind of indecency, including a wife shaming or embarrassing her husband in some way. According to this school, when a man was disgraced in any way by his wife, he could divorce her. So for example, how many of you have ever burned, uh, I'm going to talk to the women because that's the way the law was written, but please know I don't think it's fair. How many of you have ever burned your husband's supper? Oh, be honest, come on. That was like 10 hands. <laughs> So, if you burned your husband's supper, you could, that, it could, could be conceived that that was some way dishonoring your husband, and so he could divorce her. If she was not as pretty as she used to be, he could divorce her. If she laughed at him for some reason, he could divorce her. It could be any reason that would be grounds for divorce for the man. Now, notice here, as I said, that the man has all of the power. He is the only one who can initiate divorce. And if he decides he wants to be divorced for whatever reason, the wife has absolutely no recourse whatsoever. In a patriarchal society, a woman who had nowhere else to go, one who couldn't turn to adult children or parents or a new husband, was left destitute. Women were, were seen as disposable, as one step up from livestock. And many men married and divorced them on the slimmest of grounds without regard for their needs or their humanity and just sent them out. So it is perhaps not at all surprising that the school of Hillel, who had the liberal interpretation, was a little bit more popular among the people, especially the men, because it gave them a little more freedom to decide what they wanted to do. So the Pharisees were essentially asking Jesus to pick a side. If Jesus agreed with the school of Shammai, it would make many people turn away from his teaching because that was the less popular school. Or if he agreed with Hillel's exposition, which had become the common Jewish practice, the other side would blame Jesus for his moral laxity on the matter of divorce. So for this reason, the Pharisees must have thought that Jesus would not be able to find a loophole. No matter what he answered, he was going to make somebody angry. So Jesus first asks them what the law of Moses says, and they tell him. And then he replies, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. Do you notice what he does? He doesn't really answer the question. It's interesting, I think, to see the clear difference between what they asked and how Jesus answered. They asked Jesus in verse 2, is it lawful for man to divorce his wife? The literal translation says, is it permitted or is it possible? They were asking about whether they were permitted to divorce or not. And then in their response to Jesus' question, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce. Their focus was only on the permission and possibility of divorce. But Jesus shifts the conversation from the legality of divorce to the intent of marriage. In both verses 3 and 5, Jesus is talking about command and law. These two words are from the same root. So Jesus, in the way he responded to them, was asking them to think about the true meaning and teaching of the law that they were quoting. He was saying to them, there is neither command nor encouragement to divorce contained in that passage in Deuteronomy. Moses didn't command divorce, but he referred to certain procedures in case a divorce took place. The certificate of divorce was a means of protection for the woman to keep her from shame as she returned to her family. And then Jesus shifts the conversation to the intent of marriage. Excuse me just a second. He moves the Pharisees beyond the Deuteronomy passage to the creation story. The time when all was right both with our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another. Our Christian tradition has long affirmed that humans are very complex beings. We have bodies made of flesh, but we also have a soul, a spiritual side, that thirsts to be in relationship with God. Sometimes in theory, we can talk about the different sides of our human existence, but in practice, we cannot nearly divide them. We cannot clearly and simply divide the body from the spirit. In this life, the two are interlinked. So what happens to the body affects our soul, and what happens to our soul affects our body in real and tangible ways. Think about the way that stress physically affects you. 
The marriage involves both our bodies and our spirits. It is designed to join us not just bodily with one another, but also emotionally and spiritually. The Bible's depiction of marriage is a beautiful gift where two people wholly give themselves to one another. This is not just a physical intimacy, but it's an emotional and spiritual one as well. It is to be completely trusting, completely open, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It is in one sense to be completely naked in every sense of the word with your spouse. The Genesis account tells us that they were both naked and were unashamed, that they had given themselves completely to one another and completely to God. And when that relationship ends, when divorce happens, when we pull apart from the other person, it's not like a clean cut. It's more like a ripping or a tearing. We're left with a jagged edge, and little pieces of them stay with us, and little pieces of us stay with them. The term hard hearts that Jesus uses when he answers the Pharisees is often used in the Bible. It's referring to one's soul becoming hardened by sin's deceitfulness and losing sensitivity to wrongdoing. Scripture tells us that Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and so he will not let the Israelites go. And the gospel names Judas as having a hard heart right before he betrays Jesus. A hard heart is one that is selfish to a fault and insists on taking care of one's own self. To those Pharisees with hard hearts, Jesus showed God's original intention for marriage. He quotes the book of Genesis, chapter 2, and he reminds them that God chose to create human beings as two who come together in marriage. In other words, God created marriage, whereas man created divorce. Dr. Kelly Flanagan, a psychologist, wrote a blog post about the purpose of marriage, and she says basically the same thing. Uh, he, he says, marriage is where our egos lay down so our souls can get up and walk, like newborn foals on wobbly legs. It's where our egos go to sleep so our souls can awaken, like squinting eyes in the bright light of a brand new day. It's where ego things, like condemnation, competition, and condescension go to die, and soul things, like empathy, courage, sacrifice, commitment, forgiveness, unity, and peace, grow and blossom and flourish. Marriage is the space in the world that prepares us to change it from the inside out. This passage about divorce is one that can be looked at in a variety of ways, and has been. It can be looked at as an admonition against divorce, which over the centuries has been used to shame couples who decide that it is no longer wise for their union to remain intact, and even more hurtfully, to shame those individuals who are the ones left behind and left alone after a divorce that they did not want or ask for. But in taking time to look at this passage further, I do not believe that Jesus was making a hard and fast declaration against divorce. And I don't believe that he was saying that individuals who do divorce are more sinful than others. Rather, I think that Jesus is making a statement about the effect of divorce on the community and the way that it was used in a broken system. What Jesus is saying about divorce is not so much that it is sinful, though it is certainly not what God intended or ultimately planned for this world, but rather that those who claim to be righteous because they have followed the law, but still cast their wives out for minor offenses like a burned dinner, or because they are more concerned with their social standing, are the ones who are sinful. Because any time we cast aside the vulnerable for our own pleasures, we find ourselves on the opposite side of God. Jesus is saying to us that we need to care for the vulnerable and protect that at all cost, and that having a certificate of divorce, which is sanctioned by the law because of the people's hardness of hearts, does not erase the brokenness of the situation, and it does not repair the damage that has been done to those who have no recourse for themselves. I want to read you just the next couple of verses that come right after what John read, starting at verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. <clears throat> 
After this big, long discussion about divorce with the Pharisees and then with his disciples, we come to the story of Jesus welcoming the children, one of the most beloved and most often depicted in stained glass window stories of all time. We see the children coming to Jesus and the disciples trying to keep the children away from Jesus. But Jesus orders them to stop and to let the little children come to them. him. He is saying that we should bring those who are vulnerable and powerless and broken to him. Jesus promises that all of those who find themselves vulnerable with no place to go and no one to care for them, those who are cast aside and neglected by others, those who are told they have no worth or value, those who have no excuse and those who have nothing to offer, it is to these, these that will inherit the kingdom of God. And they are the ones who are eager to be taken up into Jesus' arms and to be blessed. Now, we might listen to that and think that we are not the broken ones. We don't like to think that we're broken, but the truth is that we all are. We all have scars and woundedness. The world has battered us, and we have battered each other. Every time we sin or are sinned against, we become wounded. We are the broken and the vulnerable and the sinners that Christ came to love and to forgive and to save. For when Jesus says, let the little children come to me, he is not just saying that physically children are welcome, but rather that all of those who are God's children are welcomed. Just as Jesus did for the children in the gospel story, Jesus crouches down to our level. He opens his arms wide and invites us to receive his healing embrace. No matter the reason for our vulnerability or the reason for our brokenness, Jesus' embrace is the same for each one of us. May you experience the healing and rest that can only be found in the arms of our Savior. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.